vision best realized. That's what we're going to be talking about today, a vision best realized. We all have vision, physical vision. Some work better than others. Some of us are wearing glasses. Some of us aren't. But what about a spiritual vision? Uh, Many of us in here have had a vision for future, meaning an idea or a perspective or a sight about something that has not yet come to be, right? Um, I have, my wife and I have three children outside of the womb and one still cooking. And we have ideas and we have plans and we have visions for our kids. We would like to see our children be of a certain type and not of another type. Do you know what I mean? Everybody with me? Let me see your hands. Everybody with me? Okay. Who's got kids? Okay. This message specifically is for parents, but if you don't have kids, you still have a vision. And so what I'd like to do is help Um, Maybe bring back to mind the vision that God has given you at one point. Maybe it's a forgotten vision. Maybe it's a not yet realized vision. Or maybe it's, I'm praying for a vision and I just don't see it. So we're going to kind of, I hope to be bringing that out in you, that the Holy Spirit births that in you uh, today. But have you ever wondered why? um, It's amazing to look around the world and to see the different people that are focused in different ways. And it seems to be at least that wealthy people are the people with the main vision or they're the ones that drive economies or they're the ones who motivate governments to do whatever it is to be done. Do you know what I'm talking about though? Like it seems like wealthy people are the only people with a drive to go see something that they haven't yet realized. You know what I mean? Whereas not to, I'm not drawing a a good versus bad, but poor people tend to stick in their poorness and allow themselves. And I know there's circumstances. I know there's things that keep people oppressed. I'm not, I'm not trying to get into that, but oftentimes in a poor mentality, there's just a woe is me. And just a depression falls in and sets in. Not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying that that's usually what happens. And it's, why is that though? Why is that? Um, I believe for some of the reason, it's that money makes a person think that they're, that it's possible for them to do whatever they want. If you have money in this world, especially in America, you can do whatever the stink you want to do. Isn't that right? It seems like money makes anything possible. If you've got money, you can get, you can attain, you can acquire, you can have virtually whatever you want, and you can have loads of it. It seems like money makes all things possible. But we who know the Lord know that that's not true, isn't it? The Bible says, with God, all things are possible. It doesn't say with money all things are possible. Money can do a lot of things, but it can't do everything, right? And obviously, it can't buy a person's eternal life. So let's consider Matthew 19. We're going to be looking first at verse 16. Matthew 19, verse 16. Let's look at uh, and consider now the events of Jesus and this rich young ruler. Now, we're just going to say that he's an American (laughs) because we're here in America and it's easier to relate to us than others, right? He's rich, he's young, and he's a ruler, and he could probably have anything that he wanted, right? The Bible describes him as a rich, young ruler ruler, especially in that day and culture, if you're rich and a ruler, well, nobody's going to come against you. I mean, you're, you have authority to tell other people what to do. So he's a rich young ruler and he could probably have whatever he wanted, but there's one thing that he couldn't have. And that's why he's come to Jesus. He couldn't have realized a dream of eternal life. And that's why he needed to talk with Jesus. And he said in verse 16, teacher, 
What good things must I do to get eternal life? Now, that was indicative of their culture. They're very law-driven. They're very legal-driven in the sense of if I just keep the law, I will be a good Jew. If I just persevere and keep and plug away at what I'm supposed to do, then I'll be good and good people are better than bad people. And I don't want to be a bad person. You can see that when Pharisees, oh, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like the others. There was an arrogance, a tinge in that culture of arrogance. And so you can see how that is being played out here. So he's saying, Jesus, what do I have to do? Tell me, Lord, tell me anything. What do I have to do? I'll go do it. I have all the resources of my people. What do I need to do? I'll have somebody probably do that for me even. What do I need to do to get eternal life? So then Jesus goes on through a list of things like, you know, don't murder. Uh, don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Give false testimony. And the rich young ruler, he says, well, you know, God, I, all these things I have done, I've kept them all. What do I still lack? I don't, I don't possess right now eternal life. What do I still lack? And so far in his vision, in this rich young ruler's vision, things are still intact. Uh, his dream of eternal life is still alive. But then Jesus deals the death blow. <laughs> he says, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. So this isn't a knock on rich people. <laughs> I'm not a rich person, but I have a rich father. This isn't a knock on wealth. If you're wealthy, praise God, but use that wealth for his glory and not your own. His vision, this rich young ruler, his dream died the moment Jesus said, go and give your wealth away. It died because to him, to this point, his wealth was his security. And it was even his salvation to some extent. And now Jesus is saying, get rid of your security blanket and then follow me. Trust me, live for me. His vision in that moment of, G of hearing Jesus say that his dream died and his vision blackened because his hope was in his wealth and Jesus told him to give it all away. Now it's remarkable to read between the lines of scripture. And what the scripture doesn't say is anything else about this man. We just know that his vision died. We know that he went away sad. He we know that he went away distraught or maybe even confused. We don't know the end result of this man. The Bible doesn't say anything else about him. All we really know is that his vision died. So I want to tell you about uh, another, uh, a lady, um, a lady that lived about 300 odd years after Jesus. Um, this, this was a mom who had a vision or had a dream for her son. Any mothers in here? I see some moms. It's not Mother's, Happy Mother's Day, but I'll say it anyway, Happy Mother's Day. This was a mom who had a vision or a dream for her son, and she referred, or she is referred to even now in the Catholic Church as Saint Monica. She was born of Christian parents in North Africa and died near Rome in AD 387. We're told very little of her childhood. All we know really about her is that she was married to a man who hold, he held a position in the city, but he was a pagan and he had a very violent temper and he appeared to have many, very many bad immoral habits. And so this naturally caused a gulf between herself and her husband because her good deeds and her prayers, they really annoyed him. And there were, out of this union, there were three children that came. And the oldest, his name was Augustine. And Monica's married life was far from being happy, uh, but, but she still held out a great hope for her son. And who, as parents, we know, 
that you want more for your children than you have had yourself, right? Can I get an amen? All right, you still with me? I know my dad said this all the time, and it's very true of me, that when we preach, we tend to cure insomnia. (laughs) Sometimes, you know, okay. Anyway, I just want to know that you're still with me, okay? But Monica had been unable, at this point in their history, she had been unable to get her child baptized. But Augustine, he eventually became very sick, and even to the point of death. And finally, at that point, Her pagan husband still at this time uh, would allow Augustine to become baptized, but he was so sick, he had to recover a little bit. But as he started to recover and get well, her husband withdrew his permission and would not allow him to become baptized. Now, all of a sudden, Monica, as a mother, she had great anxiety, and it was all centered around Augustine. She wanted her firstborn to be saved, but there was a problem. He was a millennial. (laughs) He was wayward and he was lazy. (laughs) I say that as a millennial. I can say that. You can't say that about me. So his parents sent him off to Madura. And while he was there, Monica wrestled with God intensely for his salvation. But a great consultation was given to Monica because her husband, this mad tyrant pagan man, became a Christian. And after this, some time, uh, Augustine was sent to Carthage to further his studies. But it was at Carthage that he fell into some very serious sin. Not too long after his father died, and after his reception into the church, Monica resolved to never marry again. Now at Carthage, Augustine, he's there, he's studying, he had become uh, a religious skeptic. And upon his return home, he espoused some very heretical views, even to the point of where this faithful Christian mother rejected him from her table. She drove him away. But then she remembered a strange vision that she had earlier concerning him. See, there was a time where she went to a bishop who consoled her, And he said to her these words, the child of your tears will never perish. So this was her vision. Her vision was that her firstborn son would not die lost. Obviously, it wasn't that your son is going to live forever. It was in reference to his salvation. The child of your tears will never perish. So her vision, it was to see her son become saved. Her vision was, was to see the best for her kid, that the child of her tears would never perish. However, shortly after Augustine, he snuck off to Rome against his mother's will. In Monica, she prayed fervently for her pagan son, Augustine, that he would not go to Rome because there she knew, no doubt, he would become corrupted. But he went anyway. And so here you have a mother praying for her son and praying that her son would not do something. And then he goes and does the very thing she's praying that he would not do. Her vision for her son was crushed. It died. However, in Rome, Augustine heard St. Ambrose preach and he became a Christian. Amen. He went into the priesthood, and eventually he was appointed to Bishop of Hippo, not the animal. (laughs) During that time, he wrote several spiritual classics, and it turned out that he was the most heavily read author in Europe for a thousand years to come. And St. Monica's vision was that her son would become a Christian. And God ultimately gave her the desires of her heart. But through God's plan, through God's vision, Augustine was not just a good boy. He, through God's plan, when he came to Christ, God's plan also saved a million other mothers' sons and brought them to Christ. 
But see, Monica's vision or Monica's method, trying to prevent Augustine from going to Rome and even praying fervently that he would not go, it would have prevented Augustine from hearing the gospel. And Monica was getting in God's way by insisting on how and where God should make Augustine a Christian. So God denied Monica's specific request, but ultimately gave back to her the desire of her heart. See, her original dream and vision for her son had to die. Then God could resurrect it with much more of a life than it would have ever had before. Without death, we cannot fully fulfill all that God has for us. This is not just true of of this life, but it's also true of the life to come. The only way that we are going to fully enter into the fullness of heaven is through death. Whether we physically die or spiritually die, a death has to happen. John 12, 24, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So unless it dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many, many more seeds. Much more than it could have provided for itself if it was still alive. Now, how many Christian parents are guilty of dedicating their children to the Lord and then violating that very dedication by failing to release them into God's will and even going as far as determining God's will for them. We often fail to, re- uh, to fully release them because it would go against our vision for our kids. Why is that? Who here has ever died? That's what I thought. No one, I, I, I was a little worried before service, I'm going to ask that question. I thought somebody might raise their hand, but it turns out none of you have died yet. But you know what we do? We struggle with things we don't know. But we can attest that the death of our soul to the world and coming alive to Christ was a good thing, was it not? Who's saved? You know the redemptive work of Christ the best thing that could have possibly happened to us here on earth or in eternity. But yet we don't want to see our children die. We tend to control their lives to the point that they remain a single seed all of their lives. And the problem is a single seed, it can't bear much fruit because often we won't allow God to work that seed into his will. Now, I'm going to ask this question, and really where it should drive you is to saying, wow, I I really am very small. And And the question is this, what do you really know about what God wants to do for your children? What do you really know and understand as far as the eternal plan and will for your children in God's vision. There's really not a lot that we do know, is there? I mean, we know the promises of Scripture, and we know His Word is true, and we know that the Word will never return back void. Matthew 19, 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? So here you just have Jesus interacting with this rich young ruler. And you heard Jesus say, go and sell everything and follow me. So now you have the disciples standing around Jesus and saying, well, who can really be saved? Verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, how many things are possible? All things are possible. 
So this was even the beginning of the death of a vision for the disciples. Because the disciples, like the rich young ruler, were just following the good principles of life, the law. They were doing what they should do as good Jews. They were just following through with this law. But Jesus is saying, what you're doing is impossible. You need God. So they were astonished at what Jesus told the rich young ruler. And they basically said, in essence, if he can't be saved, what hope is there for us? If he can't even be saved after following all of the law and the letter of the law, then who can be saved? At this point, the disciples did not yet realize that salvation was by grace. And they were still steeped in the Jewish faith and tradition of following the law. So when Jesus said to them that following the law will not get a man into heaven, I can imagine that initially their hopes were pretty much crushed, right? Can you imagine if you thought one way the entire life, your entire life, only to come out the moment before you die and somebody's saying to you, you had it wrong. Your 90 years, you were living wrong. You need to actually do this. That's basically what was happening with the disciples. They obviously, um, their dreams were crushed. Their hopes were destroyed. But at the crucifixion, the rest of their hopes died too. <laughs> their hope of making it into heaven through this rabbi, this teacher, the, the Christ. Now to see him die Man, that just crucified my hope also. But it only died temporarily, amen? Three days later, we know that God resurrected their dreams and their visions when Christ was raised from their dead. Remember, or notice how I said their dead? Christ was raised from their dead. They were dead in their vision until they saw the resurrected Christ. And so I believe there's an important principle here. So next time a door closes or the Lord flat out says, no, spoiled little child, you can't have what you want. Or a dream of ours goes up in smoke. Remember this little principle. In life, something has to die before something else can be born. Jesus had to die before he was raised to new life. So first there is a death of a vision. Then there is the rebirth of a vision. So in the Lord's economy, what gives birth to new life had to die somewhere else. And we believe in the overcoming power of the resurrection, amen? Amen. And we know that life conquers death, amen? But this is also true, is that God gives back to us in improved forms what we, what we have sacrificed to him in our obedience. So do you want your child to live for God? In obedience to God, give your child up to God. And obviously we know that that story was the story of Augustine, one of the great uh, pillars of the, of the Christian world, the Christian church. But I want to talk to you about another man. His name was Hans Luther. And like most people in the Middle Age, he grew up on a farm. As he grew up, he became a miner, um, taking on the backbreaking work of digging for ore. And Hans eventually... He saved up an, enough money to buy a smelter so that he could start the process himself of refining this ore to become a businessman. Now, much like our world today, becoming a businessman in his world gave him something that was harder to achieve than money. It gave him a measure of stature. And he had never gone to school and he had never learned to read but Hans Luther became a member of the middle class, which allowed him to sit on the council. 
He eventually married a, a lady named Margaret, the daughter of the richest family in their village. This was a thriving metropolis of a whopping 60 people. <laughs> it's a big town. You might even know everybody there. They had eight children. And their second son was born on November 10th, 1483. Now this is 1,100 years after Augustine. So we have a very, very, very brief history of the man who would become to be known as Martin Luther. Now, what I want us to do, though, is I want us to focus on Hans Luther, the father. Hans Luther, his dream for his son began to develop at this point because he started to notice the giftedness of Martin. And so he, as a businessman and then marrying the rich girl, had the money and the ability to send him off for a formal education. Now he did this, Hans did this for Martin, both for Martin's sake, but also for the sake of the family. How many of us have dreams of our kids because it would help our family? But he sent him off for education and he sent him to school at age seven. Now Hans wanted the best for his son, no doubt. What parent doesn't, right? Uh, so he decided to further his education and sent him on to university which was something that very, very few of their social class would even be able to aspire to. Um, to get the money, Hans would just work harder. So he was working so that his son could live better than himself. Sounds pretty noble of parents, right? So eventually, Martin earned a bachelor's degree, and he, he graduated second in his class, and his father and his family were very, very proud of him. Now, you have to understand, too, that in the medieval university, only after getting both a master's degree, a bachelor's and a master's degree, could a student, a student then go on into the specialized field of law. And that's what Martin decided to do. During the whole time, Luther was spiritually troubled, and he was very vexed as a young man. Even all of his education, he was still very troubled, and his soul was turned down. But while going through these spiritual struggles and battles of depression, Luther, for the first time in life, held a Bible in his hand. Now, he, at this point, like many other in that culture in that day, um, they've read some of the Psalms, maybe, uh, for devotions, and they heard brief texts of scriptures in the church. And he thought, really, that that's all that the Bible was, that that's all that the Bible had to offer, was these few psalms and these couple scriptures here and there. But he now held a huge book in his hand, and it was a very, very new thing for him. Uh, because only people with master's degrees could hold a Bible or check it out of a library. You have to also understand that a lot of churches back in this day didn't even have Bibles in their churches. Only a person with a master's degree was allowed to hold or to rent out the Bible. But one day Martin was on a four mile walk back to his university when he was caught in a thunderstorm. And suddenly right next to him, a bolt of lightning struck. And the electricity just knocked him to the ground. To Luther, this was not just a weather-related accident. This wasn't just some freak thing that happened. To him, the, stor the storm that was literally raging all around of him was symbolic of the storm that was raging inside of him. And he thought to be zapped by this physical lightning would be to take on the punishment of God. And in that moment, Luther vowed then and there to renounce the world and to become a monk. His father was ticked off. <laughs> he just put all this money into this boy to become a good social standing uh, man and, and propel his family into a status that they couldn't get to on their own, to become an influential member of society. And his father's dream was dead. 
because monks, they devoted their whole life to God, which to them included um, never getting married, never having children, never gaining status or a family. So Hans took Martin out of his will. But God had a plan. And his monastery eventually recognized Martin's giftedness and they sent him to go on to the priesthood so that he could complete his education to get his doctorate. And during this time, he befriended a man who uh, became Martin's spiritual guide. Now, this man was eventually sent to the town of Wittenberg to start a university. And he knew that Martin was a gifted young man, so he um, sent for Martin to come and pursue his doctorate at his new university. And this man was a huge advocate of Augustine. Remember, this is just now over 1,100 years after Augustine. And, and so this man challenged all of his university students to read the writings of Augustine and to study them. Now, Augustine wrote extensively on grace. And here, Martin Luther was convinced of God's judgment on him. And now he's hearing about God's grace. And he was introduced to the concept of grace for the very first time while at Wittenberg. And it was on the doors of the Wittenberg church that Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis, which eventually radicalized the whole world. Now, Hans Luther had a dream for his son to be an influential member of society. But his dream that died was eventually reborn in a much more dramatic way than he, he, than, than he could have ever imagined had Martin Luther become simply a lawyer. He could have become a lawyer. He could have been a good Christian and lived a good life. But he would have only remained a single seed. But because the seed died, it has now been born into many seeds. And in fact, too many to count. So I think the connection between Augustine and Luther is very remarkable. And it's because both of them, in their parents' eyes, were failures. But only temporarily. They both came back to God in unimaginable ways. So that was the rich young ruler, and that was two members of the Christian church. But now I want us to shift our focus a little bit. Now let's go down to the crux of the matter. At the very center of everything that we've been talking about is the will of God. And I may have dreams and I may have visions, but what is God's will? And how that particular dream and how that particular vision is going to be fulfilled. And we know that God gives us dreams. We know that God gives us visions. So these things are good. And usually there's nothing wrong with our dream or vision. And for the most part, God himself put that desire in us to begin with. So the vision is not the problem. But believing God for fulfillment becomes the problem. And it comes down to one prayer. Not my will, but thine. Mark 14, 33 and 36. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Jesus said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. So at this point, there's something that's horrifying that he knows he has to face, even though others around him don't know. And he nearly dies with the burden of this. In the heat of the conflict, of the passion of dealing with this, he nearly dies. Mark fourteen thirty five. going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he says, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. 
So in some inexplicable way, 6,000 years of sin was condensed into one horrid cup of evil that was infused into his being. No human can comprehend the tremendous reverence and submission Jesus had to possess towards his father for him to utter those fateful words, not my will, but thine. Do you remember when the disciples said to Jesus in Matthew 19, how can a man be saved? Jesus responded to them by saying, with man it is impossible, but with God everything is possible. So in other words, Jesus knew full well that his father could have easily delivered him from this dilemma. But instead, he submitted his will to the will of his father and said, not my will, but thine. So St. Monica's request, they were denied. All of her requests were denied for her son, not, not because they were bad, but because they were too specific. They were too narrow in their scope of understanding. She made the mistake of having too little faith or too small of a picture. And Hans Luther, he did the exact same thing. He prayed merely for his son's well-being while God was concerned of the well-being of the world. He was concerned with one man while God was concerned with all men. So if God had granted St. Monica's prayers the way that she prayed them, he might have had to deny her vision and her desire altogether. But because the vision died, the vision was given back as the desire of her heart. She would have simply been better off to bring the desires of her heart first to God and then left the matter in his hand left it for God to work it out. And this was the word that God gave to St. Monica. What he said was through that priest, he said, the child of those tears shall never perish. And I believe that that is the word for our church today. So my question is, what is your vision? Are you willing to allow God to bring about your vision? What plans do you have? What's your desire? What's your dream? What's your vision? Is it for one, from God? We have to eliminate that possibility that it's not from God first. And we do have dreams and visions that are not from God. Let me, <laughs> I'm the first one to testify to that. We have plans that are our own and they have nothing to do with God. We have religious perspectives and ideologies that are completely far from God, like the rich young ruler. But what is God's plan and what is God's vision? And are we willing to lay down our plans and to understand that we need to allow God to fulfill his plan? I've said it before and I'll say it again is that we often seek the good things of this world. It's good to pray that your son doesn't fall into sin. Amen. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to do. But you know what? God can handle a little bit of sin. And just because someone has sinned doesn't mean they have fallen from grace or the opportunity to be saved. But we often seek the good things, but the good things of this world are the enemy of God's perfect will. What we consider to be good and righteous are indeed filthy rags. And we must be the first ones as his church to lay down our plans and our understanding and our vision in order to see the will of God carried out. A vision best realized is one that has been given back to God and allowed him to see it through to the end. So 
I'm going to close with this idea. We're going to, we're going to pray and then we're going to go be the church. You know what I mean by that, right? When we leave here, we're not leaving church. We're leaving a collective gathering of saints, but we're going to go and be the church. So first I ask this to the church. What is your vision of faith? And now let me shape that a little bit, define that a little bit, a little bit more. Who is your vision for faith? Your vision needs to have a face. Hans and Monica, they knew the faith, the face of their sons. Their vision had a name. Who is the vision or who is the face of your vision? Because your vision should be to see that face, that face come into faith, a lot of F words here, that vision to see the faith to come into the glory of God. Your vision to see that face come into God's plan and to come into God's will. So I said this in the beginning, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would imprint onto everyone here the face of a vision. So who is your face? Who are you actively having faith for to see them come into the vision of God? Now it struck a chord with the church that I was with last night and I'll say it again here, but you know what happens to us when we get old in life? We tend to retire and we take on a retired mentality in the name of Jesus. You cannot retire from the gospel. Do you hear me? Do I need to say it again? You cannot retire from the gospel. So if you are waking up without vision of faith, you are waking up outside of the will of God. Let that sink in a minute. <laughs> I'm not here to be popular. I'm just here to listen to my boss. Your vision needs to have a face because your vision should be to see the glory of God revealed in and through the lives of those who are around you. So I was, I'll say it to this way and then we'll be done. Um, I watched my, my grandparents go through dementia and into Alzheimer's and, and that sickness took over their life and it made them into something other than what they intended to be. Okay. This happens to life. This happens in life. We can't control that. We're just good servants to the Lord and we live and die by him. Amen. But what if everyone alike, the old, the young, and everybody in the middle, what if we would determine in our heart right now to wake up every morning with a plan to see God's vision instead of planning for our funeral? I met with Diane Unrein, and I spoke with her about her funeral. To many, that's a very awkward conversation. But she knew where she was going because she had a plan and a vision to see the face of God. And she did. And she is right now. But until that day comes, so everybody needs to have that plan and vision to see Jesus face to face. But until then, we should have milestones and markers of accomplishment every day, all the way until that day. And that is where we instill the plan and the vision in others to see the face of Jesus. Because if your plan is not to see others come to Christ, your plan is to die and you will die. The reality of it is just the other day, there was a casket in front of me with an empty body in it. And that is going to be the fate of everyone. So your plan should be to see people avoid that fate as their only hope of escape. Some people are afraid to live, so they take their own life because they can't live with their past. Some people are afraid to live, so they're driven by fear. Oh, I can't talk to them. Oh, oh no, they might be offended. 
Get over it. (laughs) Political correctness is from hell. Get over it. Offend for the gospel. Because there is nothing more offensive that I have ever heard than to for the Lord to say to me, you're filthy, you're dirty, and you're incapable of doing it on your own. You need to submit to me. There's nothing more offensive to say to somebody than you're not good enough. <laughs> now, obviously we wouldn't go do this. We would speak it in love, right? So don't, don't say, oh, my pastor told me I could just go tell people they're, di- they're dirty. It's like, no, I didn't say that. Listen to what I said, not what I didn't say. <laughs> we speak truth in love, but the truth of it is we are incapable on our own. But what we are capable on our own is we are capable of death. That's why the scripture says there's life and death in your words. So is your vision to speak life every day to people or is your vision to see yourself die? Heavenly Father, Jesus, you're the author. That means what you say, we do. If I author a story, I pen it how I want it to go. So Lord, today I commit myself to following what you decide for me and not me in my stubborn, stinking arrogance that needs to be crucified on the cross to say, not thine will, but mine. And in death, Jesus, I say to you, not my will, but thine. So Father, forgive our old arrogance that has been around since the beginning that says our thinking is superior to God's plan. This is a lie straight from the enemy's mouth. And Father, fill us with new life and excitement to see come about our vision as we pick up the vision of the cross. And we know, Lord, that your will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Jesus, I'm I'm going to ask that in this church, you would establish your holy vision. And I'm also going to ask Jesus that you give the grace and the favor to this body to say, yes, Lord. Jesus, I ask that you would have your way. I ask that you would bless us as we go this week, as we go out onto our vision field that we be people with intention and purpose and a plan of salvation ready at a moment's notice to be able to speak the words of life as you have spoken them to us. And to Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I bind the enemy that would convince the minds of any believer that they do not know how to worship or that they do not know how to testify or that they do not know how to live for God. I bind him in the name of Jesus. God, I ask that the reality of my salvation story is enough to testify of the goodness of God. So Jesus, I ask today that if we go to a lunch or whatever after service, whoever we bump into, that we would be able to say with boldness and authority and in truth and love, I'm a Christian, and I've, fa- I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ. And if you knew me before Christ, you would, be ash- you would be ashamed to say that you knew me because of my sinfulness. But I found Jesus loving me the whole time. Can I pray for you? And God, in that moment, you would give the words to speak as if they were on trial, standing before the accuser, that you would give them the words to speak, Lord, that your glory would be realized 
today. Have your way, Jesus, in your name. Amen.